Okay, I'm ready to get this show on the road. But before we do, I've been told that there is a gentleman with us today who is 101 years old. Where is he? I don't see anybody in the crowd. I'm glad you didn't point to me. So, Mr. Diaz. I talked to his daughter earlier in the week and, and we, she wasn't sure at the time whether they were going to be able to come or not. So I am delighted, yes. more excited than I was to begin with. So that, that's great. Don Thank Higgins. you Richard for coming Hancock. and making the effort. Um, <coughs> I'm excited today, not only because Mr. Diaz is here, but because I have been looking for our speaker today for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally have found him, thanks to Rita Hutt, who is here also. So thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Richard Gonzalez. And uh, as I was thinking about introducing him. You know, I'm always kind of haphazard with my introductions, and I probably will be again, although I did give it a lot of thought. But I came across a quote by Martin Luther King, and it goes, we may have come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. <laughs> and I got to thinking about that as we try to understand one another. And I thought, now if I'm going to be on an extended cruise on this boat with all these people I don't know, I want to find out about them. I want to know what their hopes are, what their dreams are, what their history is, what struggles and challenges they've confronted, what their experiences have been. And I found just the man. <laughs> to, to help me do that, to help me understand and get to know these people that I'm traveling with on this boat. Um, I also want to know how we're different, how we are alike, and there are some of those ways. But in the Mexican American community, it is a growing community with each passing year. It's a significant community and it's an important community. And many of us, including myself, don't know a whole lot about this very important community. So lots of reasons to be glad Mr. Gonzalez is with us. So let me tell you about him. He's not as fortunate as most of us sitting here. He was born in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not his fault. <laughs> he had nothing to do with, with that. Uh, he did come to Texas in 1969 and studied at the University of Texas at Arlington and finished with a degree in uh, a, a master master's degree in social work. Is that right? Mm -hmm. A uh, master's degree in social work and, and uh, professionally a licensed master social worker. He had as an avocation during all of this time writing. And when he retired, this avocation, I would say, has become his new vocation. Mm -hmm. And he is doing it uh, more and more all the time. He has written, well, one book that's been published. Oh, and I need to get those out. I'll have his books back on the table. And you can get them autographed and all of that uh, afterwards. But uh, Raza, uh, Raza Rising. Raza Rising. I mean, I've got it written down here. Just a second. Oh, Raza Rising, Chicanos in North Texas. That's the name of it. But he's since, <coughs> or has been in the process of writing two more books, uh, fiction <coughs> books. One of them, Dear Dancer, that sounds intriguing, very interesting. And the other one is Azteca. And that sort of 
the, the history of, but uh, told in a novel form, it's a fiction uh, of the Aztecs. Um, he has written, he's, he's kind of the, the um, Mexican-American Bob Ray Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> he has written uh, many op-ed pieces for the Star Telegram about the Mexican American community uh, dealing um, with the culture, the history, uh, the politics, the education, the importance of all of those things in the Mexican American community. And in the course of, of finding out all I could about him, I discovered that uh, we have much in common. Uh, a lot of things that uh, interests that we share. He is an avid reader in addition to being a writer. In fact, he's a strong advocate of the three R's. Reading, <coughs> writing, and no, running. <laughs> <laughs> he is a marathon runner. And in that respect, we are about 180 different. <laughs> uh, if you see me running, ever, call 911. <laughs> Somebody's chasing me to the <laughs> But he is a marathon runner, and you'll have to look at his tie. Uh, after all this is over, it's a marathon tie. So he, he, we do share the interest of reading and writing, but not so much the running for me. Uh, we share a, a, an interest in uh, favorite authors. He ha I saw somewhere a list of his favorite authors and at least two of them. Now he likes Ernest Hemingway. And Ernest Hemingway and I are kind of <laughs> like that. But Charles Dickens and Mark Twain, top of the list on, on my list. So we had a lot of things in common, but that running was, was the big difference. So, it is with a tremendous amount of pleasure and joy that I introduce Mr. Gonzalez, Richard Gonzalez, father of three, author of three books, short stories, and former social worker, and the ultimate authority on all things Latino. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Resser, for inviting me to be part of this great event. I understand this is a monthly Billy Seals lecture series, and I happen to see the agenda for the, for the year, this program year, and I thought it was really tremendous. I'm really glad that Fort Worth is doing something like this. And it's done in the honor of Mr. Billy Seals, is that correct? Yeah. Who was, if I understand correctly, <coughs> was a history teacher here in the Fort Worth Independent School District and we're carrying on with that tradition of making sure our history is not forgotten. And this particular history is very important to me and I think it should be very important to you. As Ms. Resser says, the Latino community is growing by leaps and bounds. And it surprises me about the little that has been written about Mexican Americans, period, and even fewer things written about Latinos or Mexican Americans in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of those pioneers that when I see something, I want to go out and try to make it better. Because I used to complain. I said, why isn't it written? Where is it? And people would say, why don't you write it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they fell for my trap because I said, I will do it. And therefore, I've written a book, and we'll talk about that later. LTP. La Fundición, El Papalote, La Garra. How many people know what that means? Um, raise some hands, somebody who may know. A few of you, and it looks like you're Latinos who are raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so you already have a cheat sheet about that. Those are important barrios that people of the community have lived in, have worked, and have strived to achieve what we call the American dream. Mexican Americans are no different than the Europeans, than the Czechs, than the Italians, the Greeks, the English, the Irish, who
who have come to this country. Why did they come? For the American dream. That dream is still very vital and is still very important to us. We just had a recent election, did we not? And in fact, we just had an inauguration of a new president who wants to bring, as he says, the country together. We have so much divisiveness that's going on. And as Ms. Resser eloquently said, there have been a lot of divisions, and she quoted Martin Luther King saying that we may have come from different boats, but we're in the same boat today. One correction about that. Latinos never crossed an ocean. <laughs> <laughs> we crossed, if we did at all, a river. We either walked over it, swam it, but we didn't take a boat. Therefore, just to clarify <laughs> that perspective, I'm here to talk about the history of Mexican Americans in Fort Worth. That's a tall order. Just like if you were to talk about the history of the Irish in Fort Worth, that's a very tall order. And I have two hours, and let's cram it in as much as we can. And I'm going to make some immediate apologies in saying that there are a lot of people that I have researched about in this endeavor. And I can tell you that I will not be able to mention all of them. There are some that I am going to mention, some families, some individuals. But believe me, in my research that I have done, it's exhaustive. We would need 20 hours to cover everyone, and we're not going to do that. So if I don't mention some individuals that you may personally know, it's not because I didn't know about them. It's just because of a time restriction. It is not out of disrespect to those individuals. But reality is we can talk as many as we can. I believe these individuals that we talk about and the issues that we see are representative, though, of the Mexican-American community. <coughs> this here, you see here, is a march that happens every year in Fort Worth downtown. It is called the Cesar Chavez March. That is a picture of Cesar Chavez, who is a folk hero among Mexican-Americans. And we have started marching in his honor since 2001. You may know this, that Tarrant County is one of two counties in the state of Texas that has an official county holiday in honor of Cesar Chavez. That is quite an honor for Fort Worth to do that, because there's often the talk that, well, Tarrant County, Fort Worth is a real conservative county, and we wouldn't allow that kind of thing. Would we, would we really want that kind of diversity to be represented here? We outpace Austin, San Antonio. Sometimes people from San Antonio, which is predominantly Latino, will say to me, how many people do you have at your march? Well, you can see we don't have overwhelming numbers. And I say, well, we may get maybe 200. And they kind of scoff. And he said, we get like 2,000 in our march. I said, very well. That's very impressive. I said, how many people take a day off, a paid day off, in honor of Cesar Chavez? Uh, none. <laughs> oh, really? We have 4,000 employees that take a paid day off. You see how it works. It, it, it depends on your perspective. So, before I go any further, to hopefully establish some credibility, this is the research I've done in order to try to understand and to distill this information that you're going to hear today. There have been a number of works written, not, well, not a lot. There's a Carlos Poyar's book that's seminal work. There's a collections in the library. There have been dissertations that have been written. Uh, this is an oral history project that took place. And this particular book is written in Spanish, but it is about Mexican Americans in North Texas. And there's my book. By the way, I'm going to brag a little bit. There is a, it's called Latino Author website. And I was invited to participate in that, or my publicist from University of North Texas Press, which printed my book, went ahead and said, can we send it? I said, sure. On December 30th of 2016, I received an email. And the email said, hey, you made the top 10 list of the best books uh, from our Latino author list, or basically all Latino written books. Well, when I went ahead and went to it, what she didn't tell me is my book was number one on the top <laughs> ten list. <laughs> wow. Yay! <laughs> In any case, 
just to establish my credibility. And other books that have been written, you can find these in the library, online, there, and uh, so we went on. This is my book, and this is from a uh, Palm Sunday march that was held in 2006, downtown Fort Worth. And Medico Perez, who is a local photographer, and he's also a local historian photographer, took this picture. This happens to be in front of the Federal Building in downtown Fort Worth that happened here, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But this is my book. <coughs> Let's get a time frame to understand where we're heading when we talk about Mexican Americans. I'm going to say year zero is 1492 when Columbus sailed. <laughs> Very good. Remember that, okay. And his name in Spanish was Cristobal Colón. We call him Christopher Columbus, but in Spanish it was Colón, and that's what they called him, right? They were, he was Italian, but he was under the, the authority of the king and queen of Spain, so he spoke Spanish. So he arrives in the Americas in zero, year zero, 1492. Cortez comes in 1519. He lands on the, on the uh, eastern coast, where we now consider it's called Veracruz. It wasn't called Veracruz then. He lands there with orders of just to establish a base. Well, he hears rumors that there are riches, there's gold to be gotten, disobeys orders, and goes rogue. He goes inland. He's got an army, he's got, he's got fire. You must remember that up until this time, the Spaniards have been fighting uh, maybe several hundreds of years against the Moors in Spain. Have you ever heard the city Matamoros? That means killing Moors. Okay, so they are expert. They were the expert fighters of the world at that particular time. So he had a lot of spunk and vinegar about him, and he said, these are Indians. We can, be a, we can beat Indians. And by the way, Indians was a misnomer, right? Columbus thought he landed in India. He said, the years of the Indios? No. <laughs> but the name stuck. So here we go. Cortez goes in and he conquers the Aztecs. So 1519 to 1521, he fights the Aztecs, defeats the Aztecs. And then Spanish, Spanish colonization sets in. Here's an important point. 1521 to 1821, 300 years of Spanish rule over the Americas, right? We're not talking about the East Coast. When history normally, we, when we talk about American history, we start in the East, Jamestown and all those, you know, Mayflower, Plymouth Rock. We're not talking about that. The Spaniards were here first before the English. Therefore, they started their colonization throughout the Southwest, going up to North America, going down to South America that we call. Went ahead and conquered it all until the Portuguese came and they took Brazil. But that's another story. <laughs> so here we go, 1521 to 1821, 300 years, Mexican decide, Mexico decided it had enough. Just like the Americans had enough of the English, the Mexicans had enough of the Spanish rule. Therefore, they had a war of independence 11 years. Republic of Mexico, where the Republic of Mexico is still in existence, but in Texas, it was in existence from 1821 to 1836. 15 years. So this part of the United States that we call the United States now was part of Mexico during this time period for 15 years. Then the Texas Revolt, right? Austin, Travis, Jim Bowie, those guys. They, 1835, 1836, one year they revolted, which resulted in the Republic of Texas, which started, which was 1836 to 1845 for nine years. Then they became part of the United States from 1845 to 1861 for 16 years. Then the Mexican-American War, is, this is significant because we'll talk about this, is uh, for lasted two years, and then the Treaty of Hidalgo, 1848 to the present. In other words, 169 years. Why do I have that in there? The Treaty of Hidalgo, which is basically a peace settlement between Mexico and the United States, said that all Mexicans living currently within what was, was, was Mexico, that is in New Mexico, Texas, California, Colorado, those areas, have one year to decide whether they're going to go back to Mexico or they're going to become citizens of the United States. If they become citizens of the United States, then they are entitled to all the civil rights, all the rights and privileges it is to become a United States citizen, as well as their property will be inviolate. In other words, whatever property they have, it's theirs. 
They will honor the Spanish land grants or whatever they have. They will honor those. So that was an important treaty. And that treaty is still in effect. <coughs> it's been in, in effect 169 years. So the term has been used, you know, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. <laughs> this is what they're referring to, is that all of a sudden now Mexico lost all this land and territory and the people that were already here and there are a significant number of Latinos who had been here already as settlers, all of a sudden became Americans, let's see. Then we have the Confederacy, 1861, 1865, four years. Then USA, you, under, you know that history, 1865 to the present, <laughs> for 152 years. Now let's do the math real quick. Remember 300 years here, 15 years here, 315 years that this land was either under Spanish or Mexican rule versus how many years has this been under either the Re Texas or Republic and, and or Confederacy and or the United States. It doesn't equal 300 years. It doesn't equal 200 years. My point of all this is that the Spanish-Mexican influence in this whole area, in the whole Southwest, has been historically longer here than what we currently call the United States of America. So when people start saying, well, go back to Mexico, go back to Mexico, golly guys, you're using the model that Martin Luther King was referring to, crossing an ocean. Unlike the other immigrants, European immigrants, we did not cross an ocean. We trace our roots here for a considerable number of years that we go back. So that comparison, that model, really doesn't fit. It may fit Europeans and the Asians and others who have come, African Americans who were forced to come here. It may fit them, but it does not fit the Mexican American experience. So we go further, real quick. This is the Aztec, just to give you a pictorial. Aztec rule, Cortez lands here. That's Cortez. That's a picture of him. <laughs> this lady here, very important, her name is called La Minlinche. She was a native, and she had this fluent ability of picking up languages. And she was able to pick up Spanish pretty quickly. And she became Cortez's consort and mistress. And she escorted him and was able to advise him of the culture of how to possibly outmaneuver court, uh, Montezuma, uh, how they were thinking, and also translate for him between the two. Now, Malinche has had a lot of different meanings and significance among Mexican Americans. Some say that she was a traitor, and some say, no, she was pretty wise and crafty. She really understood what was going on, and that argument is still going on. So this is what happens. Fighting goes on, and you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the history of Fort Worth? It does. Let me, point, let me get you there. Here's the fighting that went on between Cortez and the Aztecs. Notice the armor, notice the, the steel, notice that they have wood, and this is obsidian glass. It doesn't, doesn't compare. But even more important is they brought something that the Aztecs had never, and the Americas had never experienced before. Smallpox. The Europeans had already experienced centuries of that disease and they had already, for the most part, developed immunities to it. So they were carriers of a disease. And when you introduce a disease to a, another area that's never been exposed to that, you have a pandemic and you wipe out <coughs> thousands and thousands of those individuals. And they thought they were cursed by the gods. I said, my God, look what happened to us. So. After that, the colonial appearance started. They brought Christianity to this area. And they started looking for Cibola. They started looking for the cities of gold. They traveled throughout Texas. And this is the areas, Rio Grande, Bear, Nacogdoches. And this is called the Rio Camino, uh, Rio, uh, Camino, Camino Rayal, excuse me. And they established bases. Now here's more of a pictorial of the different missions 
that were established throughout the Southwest. You notice that one was not established up here in Fort Worth because they had not established a mission up there at this point. But throughout this region, there was extensive Spanish colonization and they, they brought the Spanish culture. But just like the Americans <coughs> in the East Coast with the English, the English brought their culture and they started <coughs> incorporating it, but they started developing their own distinct culture within their region. Same thing happened here. Mexico City was about 1,500 miles away. And this was pretty much frontier land. And therefore what happened was they started developing their own distinct Tejano culture. Different from what was established in Mexico or in the capital and in that region. So what happened was, fast forward, the Mexicans got tired of the Spanish rule. Father Hidalgo, a priest, said, we need to revolt against the Spaniards. They are here oppressing the people. Let us revolt. So a priest rose up and called what they call the Grito de Dolores. In Dolores, Mexico, he gave a grito, which means, rise up, my people. Rise up against the Spanish rule. And that resulted in masses of people, 11 years of fighting until they gained their independence. Part of the local culture is this fandango. Have you heard of the word fandango? This comes from a Spanish word, which means not going to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> it means dancing. You even have this guy shooting his little pistol. So I guess they were open carry kind of guys. <laughs> <laughs> right here, too. Right? So, but this is a way of getting to know the opposite sex, and people had a good time. And then what we introduced also, the Spaniards introduced cattle industry. They were horse riders. They knew how to lasso. They brought the cattle. The cattle was not native to the Americas. It was through the Spaniards who brought that livestock in here to this country. And they went ahead and learned how to husband cattle, how to take care of cattle. When the Anglo settlers came with their buckskin clothes, Daniel Boone, that does not fit this particular part of the country. You better change clothes and get chaparrales, leather hide, if you're going to survive in this area. So the cowboys learned the lessons from the vaqueros. By the way, vaquero means cowman, but somehow it got translated to cowboy. <laughs> Today, we celebrate the stockyards. In fact, we had just started that, did we not? That is a heritage that comes from these folks who passed it on to the cowboys and quickly learned. do -si do you know when you dance, do -si do <laughs> That originally meant dos y dos, two by two. But they just kind of anglonized it and said, do -si do do -si do <laughs> Here we call the Compañía Volante, the Flying Squadron, predecessors of the Texas Rangers. We were talking about bandidos, wild Apaches and Comanches, and also those illegal aliens called Anglo settlers <laughs> <laughs> that would come with slaves. Slavery was outlawed by Mexico by the time that the settlers started bringing their slaves from Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and the Compañía Volante would come upon them and see them and say, so who are you? And said, well, we're settlers. He says, where's your green card? <laughs> <laughs> Don't have one. And who are those folks? They're our slaves. Not here. Not here. They're free. And that was one of the issues of why there was a war of independence. Because Mexico did not recognize slavery. So here we have the cattle industry, and lo and behold, and this, you, you know this is seen probably in stockyards, or excuse me, in Sundance Square, the Chisholm Trail. This, this is a monument that's in the Capitol grounds. If you go to Austin, how this happened was a doctor from El Paso was traveling around the Capitol grounds, saw the monument to the Confederacy, saw different monuments to different heroes. And he said, where is the monument to the Tejano settlers? There was none. So he started a campaign, got legislation passed, and they finally raised the money to open up a monument to the Spaniard, to the vaquero, the cattle industry, 
just plain folks, settlers, the goats, the little kids, and it opened up, and it's there now. <coughs> and when they opened it up, you know, they had these individuals dressed like the vaqueros from that era. And we even went ahead and decided that here in Fort Worth, we decided that on Main and Central, we were going to honor the vaquero, and that vaquero statue is there. I talked to Jim Lane. Anybody know Jim Lane, the attorney? Yes. He lives up there in the north side, longtime resident, and he said that he and his father talked about this. He said, why isn't there a vaquero presence? We need to recognize that. So he contacted individuals like Manuel Valdez and other city officials as well as citizens and said, we need to recognize the vaquero influence going into the stockyards so that when people are driving down Main Street, they have to stop. Oh, look, there's a statue. And hopefully they put two and two together. You're entering in with the heritage that was blessed in this area by the vaqueros. And that's why that statue was put there. Mexican-American War. This is what was ceded by, um, by the Mexican government when that war. And this is where the Treaty of Hidalgo that we talked about. So everybody that was living here that was of Mexican heritage had that right as a result of that treaty. And this is the Chisholm Trail that we all know about, right? We have a new highway called Chisholm Tollway, really. Mm -hmm. And it comes from here, South Texas, where the big ranches are, King's Ranch and other cattle. They drove them up here. The drovers brought them up here. And as we know, let me see, we'll show some more example. Here's a, a um, statue up in Oklahoma, because they went up through Oklahoma, that reflects that. And of course, we, during the stockyard celebrations, we still honor the fact that this was originally Fort Hood, excuse me, Fort Worth as a result of American Garrison establishing here on the Fort on Bluff Avenue. And so that, that happens every year, as well as recognizing <coughs> the Indian heritage that was here. Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1920, catas cataclysmic, horrific, over a million Mexicans died as a result of this war. What it did, it was an upheaval causing migration from Mexico to the United States during that time period. In my research, I have discovered that many of the Mexicans who came here to Fort Worth were, a res were as a result of being uprooted by the Mexican Revolution. There was factions fighting and they would come onto the haciendas and they would take the food, take the cattle, and the people would be left to suffer the, the consequences. Um, Mr. Diaz, one-year-old gentleman over there, <laughs> is here as a result of the Mexican Revolution. <laughs> he was born in Mexico in 1915, <laughs> and at five months, his parents decided that they had enough of the fighting in Mexico, and they brought him over here. Two of his older siblings died of malnutrition <coughs> because they could not get enough to eat. And his parents said, we don't want our third child to die in Mexico. We're going to come to the United States and try to make a better living. And they did. And they en ended up coming to Fort Worth in order to survive. And I'm going to talk more about Mr. Diaz here in a minute. What's up? Okay, so here's the Mexican influence. Every year there is a 16 de septiembre Mexican parade. Some of you may have participated. 16 de septiembre is September 16th. Remember Padre Hidalgo? He said that on September 16th is when he said the Grito de Dolores, we need to be free. So we commemorate that every year. How did this get started? There's a